Our guest today is Roshat Becker. He's a musician, producer, audio engineer, and many, many other things, I guess. So my first question would be, how do you see your role in the music universe? What is your drive? What inspires you as sound engineer or musician or performer? Uh, those are entirely different things. Um, like as an engineer, yeah. I see myself basically as a part of the service industry. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm happy to, like if there's, as a resident culture in, in Berlin, I'm happy to be part of that as a legacy to the house that I'm working in that um, I think has been shaping certain areas of contemporary electronic mainly musical culture but also like more abstract uh, music culture. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that uh, but I don't specifically see a, a dedicated role in that. Um, I'm basically there to A, serve the music that I'm working on okay. and B, earn my rent. Okay. Um, as a musician, that is a whole different thing uh, that's very difficult to wrap up. I've never, um, I've never pondered upon like defining a role for that. I'm, I was interested mainly in uh, strategies of composition uh, more than in like putting together a certain a certain uh, sort of music or a certain variety of music, uh, but like for the last 15 years, I've been more like um, captivated by different uh, different approaches to uh, the composition process and f trying to find a, a strategy for myself that I can hold on to, because if it's just like about designing music. Um, then for me it's, it slips through my fingers very, very easily. I need uh, method and, and strategy to hold on to. Mm, maybe there's a certain similarity because I also think that mastering or any sort of audio processing uh, needs method and strategy in first place because there's so many ways you can go okay. with audio processing. It's such a simple um, science. Uh, the technology is super simple. You basically deal with three parameters in the whole in the whole audio processing. You only have amplitude, frequency, and uh, and phase, but still you can you can get lost very easily in, in decision making. Um, so I think method and strategy are the crucial uh, parts of, of qualification. Okay. So how do you find the right balance between? being in the service business as a mastering engineer and being in the creative part of the industry, meaning that you are doing sound design, and composing music, and so on. I don't see how they touch, to be honest. Really? Yeah, I mean, my when I listen to music as a music consumer, okay. um, that is a totally different mindset, a different mode of listening. Um, than to listen to music in a studio environment. Okay. My taste, my culture, my identity, they have no room there if I'm, if I'm a so an audio engineer. Okay. And they stay out of this process nearly entirely. I, it took me some effort in the beginning, but now it actually doesn't. Um, I never choose the music that I'm working on <clears throat> very actively. I don't want to choose it. Um, kind of over the years, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this since nearly 20 years now, and it's kind of developed into a specialist niche okay. pretty quickly, but that was never of my choice. Uh, that was never the plan that I had. Um, it just developed this way. Um, uh, but I do not even know if I like the music that I work on most of the times, or if I try to, um, then like I'm wrong so many times. Um, okay. I, I hear music in the studio, it doesn't move me because I'm not open for it. And then like uh, five months later, I sit somewhere and hear something like, oh, this is really interesting. What is this? You worked on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or did I? Uh, or the other way around. Um, 
This, uh, yeah. So I never, like most of the time, I actually do not even know who the artist is. Uh, that is more a, that's not like of my choice, but that's just. Um, you need to use the microphones. Okay. okay. Very discreet. Yeah. <laughs> um, Next question. Uh, yeah, yeah, we lost it. But it's directly related to what you were talking right now. Yeah. So can you describe your involvement as a music listener first and master engineer second? Meaning that uh, how do you make the balance between artistic and technical decisions in the mastering process? And do you sometimes compromise perfection in favor of the vibe of the master? Oh. Uh. Okay, that's <laughs> compromise. Compromise perfection in favor of the vibe of the master. Well, what would perfection be? Meaning that uh, the balance between the technical and artistic decisions. Because yeah. from my point of view, sometimes it's better to to make some tracks or to leave them. They have some sort of imperfections because if you make them technically perfect, so they will translate let's say the best possibly in a technical way on systems but ah, because okay. of that they will lose sort of original vibe sure. which was present in original mixes yeah, absolutely i mean uh, i'm 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 i was slightly puzzled uh, about okay. the term technical perfection i mean basically in uh, the mastering process there is not necessarily uh, technical restrictions of course what you just mentioned you have to make sure that um, the material in its own right translates on a variety of listening environments. Uh, basically, I'm not too eager to compromise music to make it uh, cope with music hostile environments, like people that come and say, like, this needs to sound great in a car. I'm kind of, fuck off. <laughs> this is not, like, that's not what, what th this, I don't want to compromise uh, the, the narrative of the music so ca that it can live in an 80 dB rattling, you know, machine, um, or, or on, a, on a Sony telephone, or even an Apple iPhone. So this is, um, I'm, I'm not too eager to please these demands. But apart from that, of course, you have to make sure that um, it is, like, gracefully or easily lives on a, on a variety of hi-fi speakers and that already is a beast uh, to tackle because they tend to be um, way more they, they, they don't they don't uh, usually cope with the fundamental range as good as studio speakers do so I need to make sure that what I encounter in a studio environment will translate to a variety of, of hi-fi speakers but that is as far as technical implications go beyond vinyl. Of course, vinyl itself uh, brings brings uh, a lot of um, technical restrictions with it, and sometimes you do have to compromise. Um, you, specifically, when I just said in the fundamental range, and also in um, spatial aspects, so the, the stage, that someone might have uh, put a lot of effort into making it plausible or designing it, um, and then you will have to castrate it, yeah, yeah. to uh, specifically on on long sides, but it's way less invasive than people think. There's a lot of uh, misunderstanding uh, and uh, misinformation going around where people say like bass can only be in mono, yeah. or I heard mono sounds better in clubs, and, yeah, and things yeah. like this. There's just a lot of um, has. I think it's because um, nowadays, like the the Com composition, mixing, and basically what people conceive as the production process is mainly within one mind and one room. Yep. Um, so people have not a lot of options to verify uh, what they put together on a variety of listening environments. So they just um, copy paradigms of each other. And that's why like these things live forever and still in 2015 people come into the studio and say like I heard records are only mono yeah. and things like this. So sometimes it's a, a slight pity uh, what you have to do to music before you can put it on, on vinyl uh, but that is to make it live well off the vinyl because the playback is what shapes the sound not the cutting process really.
Okay, so... I but, sorry, to answer the second, yeah. the first, absolutely, I leave imbalances in if they are an obvious part of the narrative or of the mood of the music. I'm not interested in, uh, in, an, in an eager distribution of frequen frequencies. That's not how I address music. Okay. How do you approach, w w when you get the track, from, uh, do you communicate directly from the art with the artist, or you have a manager in between who is dealing with communication with the artist? And another thing is, when you get the mix, how do you approach it? Do you listen to it like in an artistic way, try to figure out what the artist wanted to say, or you just analyze it in a technical way, so you see there are f some flaws that you need to fix? And the main question is the role of imagination in the mastering process. When you hear the track for the first time, do you kind of get an idea, a vision, where it can go sonically? Like, how can you make it sound? Or you work in a more technical type of way that you correct the mistakes, the amount of bass, the low end, the phase, etc. Mm -hmm. um, first part, no, there's no management in between. Okay. That wouldn't make much sense. But very often there is no communication. Um, about, I guess, about 20% of the sessions are attended by either the artist or someone who speaks in her or his name. Uh, uh, but the vast majority of productions I work on, I start from scratch without instructions, without communication, and uh, without anyone present. And that's not because I wish this to be that way. It's just because we have clients from all over the world. Sometimes Japanese people, they come in just for the session and then fly back right after. But uh, the rest of the world don't do that much. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, so I think also this is partially because people... Um, I, I think mastering is built on, on trust and mutual understanding. And I... I don't want to sound smug, but like just from the legacy, um, most people who give me their material want me to uh, to really judge on it and make and make the decisions uh, because they are overwhelmed with uh, with the decision making process and too much um, mm -hmm. too much in love with details and uh, just not remote enough from the big picture. So. By far the most, even like the attended sessions, uh, by far the most uh, productions, people just give them to my hands and say like, do whatever ever you think is is necessary. And um, that's the other two parts of the question. Um, yes, uh, no. Uh, it's not a technical encounter in first place. I sit down, uh, I listen to uh, the music. I have a system of mnemotics uh, with which I memorize um, the, uh, the spectral uh, content. Uh, so to say I listen to the music and while I listen to the music I pick up on, on, on peaks uh, and for example if there's a recorded voice and you obviously he hear modes of the room it was recorded in, I memorize these modes but continue listening to the musical narrative and uh, just make a call uh, in terms of where does this want to live, what's the intention, what's the mood, um, how much of th what I um, receive to be the intention is actually uh, fully achieved and which aspects of it do need some help. And then by the end of the piece, I have a, a huge luggage of memorized frequencies and, an, uh, and indeed a vision uh, of of how I would like it to to address my body actually I do a lot of it I have the spectre mapped out to my body and I memorize how it feels I have very um, spatial annotations to sound I don't have temperature at all I don't ever feel something sounds warm or cold I'm puzzled I can't understand what people mean if they say it. I have color, uh, but I mainly have uh, spatial um, associations and uh, and haptical ones. I feel something is foamy, where it should be more elastic, uh, and things like that. 
and then I, I, I walk through the sonic scape and I feel like this should actually hit my head but I just can I, I, I can just walk through it this doesn't feel right so I memorize these things and um, then I I work on it and I, I do need to have a complete vision of what I would like it to hit me or to sound like um, before I even want to touch an EQ because if you touch an EQ without a total understanding of what you want to achieve, you can get lost very easily. I agree. So do you sometimes close your eyes and just listen to the music and process the audio to avoid like visual feedback from plugins on hardware so you don't know actually where you are, uh, so you don't have this like... Uh, you don't have that, this memory of certain settings on your uh, equipment, so you just avoid that and just close your eyes and hear where the processing leads you and then sometimes you are even surprised that uh, you expected that the setting will be really minimal or really radical but it's somewhere in between. Um, I don't have to close my eyes because my eyes are very bad and I just stop looking around here. Uh, I don't use plugins for that exact reason. Okay. I do not uh, want to judge the quality of plugins but I am not capable of uh, dealing with these numer numeric interfaces. Okay. Uh, they make me consider things that I would never consider usually. I, I, if I work with a plugin and then the ratio goes to 3.4, I take this information in and it's absolutely useless information. But I, I, I deal with it. And, and then I, I ponder upon it and I second guess it. The same uh, with the digital EQs if they give you uh, like, okay, now you have dialed back that frequency. 4.2 dBs, ooh, 4.2 dBs. <laughs> this is, I, I don't want to deal with this, yeah. uh, and I can't, so that's why I don't use plugins. Okay. Uh, and I like, a, I like a gear that is basically scale-less, no. uh, free of scale, but actually, as I said, my eyes are so bad that when I, the EQ is here, I don't see the scale. I just, you know, yeah, that is, um, yeah, um, that is no longer an obstacle for me. To, okay. to deal with, uh, with the optical input. I know, uh, though, uh, that when, um, and that's a, a big obstacle, I think, of our days in general, uh, when it comes to music production, I do consider the waveforms. I look at the piece and this changes something. Yeah. And I follow uh, the piece, when I listen to it, I follow the cursor and I see like the big peak coming up and I anticipate and that makes that makes a part of my judgment of how well the timing is is elaborated on things like this. This is a, a um, dilemma, and it's dangerous, and I don't have a good way of 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 avoiding it in many in many cases. Well, I have a shortcut where I can <laughs> turn off the screen. So sure, <laughs> yes, yeah, that's an option. Good. So, can you describe? the tools that are indispensable in your studio, like which speakers do you use, which sound processors, and why have you chosen them? Uh, do you also use custom-made or heavily modified gear? And um, questions after. Uh, the tools are rudimentary. I do have very little gear. I like that. I like not to have much gear. I, have, uh, I don't want to say brands. Um, I have a Varmu uh, tube compressor. I have uh, three different designs of EQs, four different designs of EQs and filters. Um, I have uh, two more uh, compressors. Um, I have a, a, a mastering desk uh, that is uh, discreetly built okay. with a very big transformer sitting in the summing channel uh, that I use uh, for uh, saturation. And custom built or something? Not really custom built, but there are not many of these existing. Um, I have no vintage gear. Uh, I don't care for vintage gear. Um, I have a tube distortion that I use in mastering. Um, and I have an analog and a digital limiter that I have not used in about a year. Okay. I, 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 stopped, I stopped using limiters. What about speakers? Do you have like main monitors plus some mini monitors, some real world 
Ghetto Blaster, stuff like that. I do not have any real world uh, stuff because I have a good mnemonic system. Uh, um, I have mainly one pair of speakers uh, that I work with since a very long time. And then I have a second pair of speakers that I potentially or that are there for like a second opinion, uh, but I never really use them. I understand. Okay, so one another question is, we all usually talk about equipment and uh, speakers and everything, but uh, the room itself gets forgotten in terms of acoustics and in terms of, in terms of treatment. And personal experience is that I heard rooms that uh, looked completely untreated and mm -hmm. they sounded great and mm -hmm. they had specific sound. And then I saw rooms that were like extremely well treated and they sounded like shit. Uh, it, they were not inspiring. So I'm talking sort of a room sound signature, mm -hmm. which I believe every room has. And uh, do you think that your room has a certain signature and those flaws or that are in the room probably because there are no perfect rooms, uh, do they give something to your specific sound that you can call that your studio has a specific sound in terms of acoustics and that translates into your way of working? Um, when recording. When recording. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have one very big room um, that I work in. It's uh, 110 square meters big. Uh, I do mastering in that room, uh, I do mixing in that room, and I do recording in that room. When I do recording, um, I, f I believe the room has a signature and I'm psyched every time I hear it on a recording. I love that room. It's not my achievement. I, I had an acoustician set it up. Uh, it's, as you might know, it's a horror to work with acousticians yeah. and to find a good one. And I got, got really, really, really lucky. And I'm super happy with the room that I have. It has a very speci special acoustic setup. Uh, it's, a, it's an old industrial room. One, uh, one wall is entirely glass and then there's metal boxes uh, on the ceiling that are tuned to different, it's like um, spring-loaded spring, spring -loaded, uh, resonator systems. It's just huge plates of metal in metal casings. Um, looks really nice industrial. Um, and they are all tuned to different frequencies. There's about like, I think about 40 of these boxes on the ceiling. And then there is uh, another set of metal boxes all around uh, that are loaded with uh, absorbers. Also slightly addressing different um, frequency ranges. Okay. And <clears throat> I have to say, I'm, I couldn't be more happy. Like This is the best sounding room uh, that I've ever worked in. Uh, and it has a very big sweet spot. Um, actually, the whole room is nearly sweet spot. It's like when musicians come in and we are in a long production or mixing process, you can walk a, lo a, a lot in this room. So they always because it's just like you can walk around and, and the sound never changes mm -hmm. and that's that's really a big achievement on 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 the side of the acquisition and the, the I mean what's the signature is of course like the distribution of, of reverb and uh, like per time uh, per, per frequency uh, and I'm very very happy with this it's not a it's like if you close your eyes and you um, you speak you have no idea how big the room is but it's not like it's dead. Yeah, it's yeah. just injudgeable. It's a surreal kind of room, and I, I, I like that a lot. And it sounds great on, on recordings. Perfect. One question related to that. How loud do you listen to music when you master, and do you have any advice about fixed loudness settings when you are mixing, producing? Uh, I change the level, I, I'd say maybe twice in one minute. Um, and that would be my advice. Uh, change the level a lot. Uh, of course, uh, like at the um, <clears throat> response of the ear to um, the spectrum of the music is not linear. Um, it's, uh, there's, it's, it's called fletcher Munson yeah, curves. Sure, yeah. When you listen on low volumes, uh, the representation of the low end and the high end goes down. And as you lift the volume, 
the frequency spectral warps like this. Yeah, yeah. So you have to basically evaluate, in general, what the major um, listening volume is going to be. Like, I mean, that's a weird way to put it. But if you're dealing with club music, uh, it will probably be listened to at high levels. So you have to take this into account. Uh, when mastering. When you're dealing with a solo, solo acoustic guitar, it will probably be uh, listened to at rather lower levels. So you do have to take this into account too. Um, but in, in the processing itself, you should change uh, the settings uh, to the, the level a lot. Uh, except for the final momentum, if you have everything put together, I always advise uh, people to listen to the whole album uh, once at the very low end of their attention range and uh, see if there are specific moments where they just uh, intuitively want to crank up the volume a little bit, but they shouldn't do it, just like memorize these moments and then uh, listen to it uh, one notch below where your neighbors will come and bang your door and uh, see if there's a specific spot where you like intuitively want to turn it down. But um, so for the final step, you should like have a constant level, but while working on it, you should change the volume as much as actually possible. But you have like kind of stepped controls, meaning that you you continuously vary, but you just have like three presets, like loud, medium, loud, quiet, and you always listen at the same ratio. Um, so you get the idea how things are really loud, like those bobcat systems and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, the Bob Cut system is great for movies. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I, I have one. I have one. F it's a stepped. Uh, it's a stepped uh, potentiometer, and I have one point that is for me the reference for when I'm working on a whole album and I want to um, just judge the loudness. Um, then I always go back to that setting uh, because also that I have kind of memorized, uh, so I don't have to like. Um, click around in the production with every piece. So I just go back to that setting and see like, okay, that feels approximately, it addresses me in the same way. Uh, other than that, I have no uh, preset um, steps and I don't necessarily see the value of it. I think it's very good to have one comfort level that you can really memorize and that you can fall back on. But other than that, it should change as much as possible. Okay, so what's your opinion on loudness in general? This is like a big issue, the loudness wars. Everybody wants to be as loud as possible and in recent times automatic loudness algorithms like on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, CDC, CDC kind of diminished the need for super loud stuff. So mm -hmm. uh, how do you approach it? I mean, what is the kind of philosophy behind loudness, meaning not, I know that you probably can make it loud, you can make it dynamic, but what is your like comfort zone or where do you start with the loudness? And uh, if the client uh, wants it louder or quieter, how do you approach this kind of requests? Yeah, that's difficult. Sometimes if the client um, wants it to be Rihanna loud, uh, then I just, I, 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 Rihanna comes to mind because uh, that was one of the few pop productions someone brought in as a reference and I looked at it and the whole album has 0 0.5 dB dynamics. Yeah. That is fascinating. Uh, even in the solo voice passages, it doesn't go m down more than 0 0.5 dB FS. Wow. Um, so if people, people want that as a reference, I'm basically tend to, to say I'm probably not the right person to work with. Um, I can't produce this. I don't know how people do it. I don't care. Um, and I'm, I don't enjoy it at all. Um, other than that, I do not have a fixed opinion on it. Um, of course, it's, um, it's just like tiring uh, for music culture and it's, but it's, I think it's a bigger di dilemma. I think uh, it, the loudness is just one aspect of the fetish and the obsession that people nowadays have with production. And um, I'm, I'm always trying to tame 
down the, the, the relevance or the value of that terminus, besides the fact that it doesn't really mean anything that I can, that I can grasp. If people say, like, I'm the producer, I am a producer, I don't know what that is supposed to mean. I can, I can understand composer, I can understand musician, things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I can address like the classic role of like Rick Rubin. I see yeah, that, yeah. that is production, sure. But hardly any of the people that I've met in my career are Rick Rubin. So I don't know, I don't know what they want to say when they say like, I'm a producer. And, um, and production always sounds uh, like industrial manufacturing to me. So um, I understand post-production though. Uh, but that is something that is something entirely different in its, in its significance. So I think like that the loudness phenomenon is something that is a, is a bit of a tragedy within that obsession with production. And as I, I told you yesterday, people come in and say like, "Do you think this synthesizer sounds professional?" Mm -hmm. And that's something that just wants me make, that just makes me want to cry or to throw up. It's just this, this is really tragic. And. Um, and um, yeah, and I think loudness is a part of that. People come in and say like, well, the standard these days, it's like minus nine dB RMS, so can you address my music in that way? I mean, what does that even mean? Well, that's one of wanna, the questions. What do you want to achieve with this? This is just pointless. So I never actually pay attention to RMS beyond the comparison. I pay anal attention to RMS uh, levels when comparing uh, post and pre-process, but it, as, as soon as I have ended the processing and I record, then I just set the headroom and I don't look at the RMS level because it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. The music lives in its own right and it should. And, um, and people are educated by radio, of course, I understand that, but they have to understand that the music that goes into the radio is not the music that comes out of the radio. And, um, <clears throat> and that's, yeah, people, that's why I started playing clients sometimes, like big radio hits. Uh, from the 80s, uh, because they say, like, radio, make it sound radio. And it's like, okay, this doesn't mean anything to illustrate what that means. Please listen to this piece that you heard 600 times since you were 12, and you always liked it, and then now please look at the waveform. Uh, because they, like, 80s productions, they tempted to have no limiting on them whatsoever. And, like, if you listen, like, for example, to, like, horrible things, like, Pink Floyd, another brick in the wall. This is massive on the radio. Yeah. Or, I don't know, Visage, Fate to Grey. Yeah. Pieces like this, they come through like, wow. They, uh, if you look at them, they have massive peaks. There's like in the middle of the, if the, of the song, there's one peak that is like 7 dB above yeah. the rest. So, so what? This is like, the, that's, that is, artistically, these are totally integer. They sound great on every system. And uh, they, have a, they have always been satisfying. And then when they go into the radio, of course, they are mashed because people want uh, the music to live up to the commercials, basically. But uh, that's a whole different beast. Okay. So, in relation to that, can you describe your communication with artists from receiving the mix to sending the master for approval? Uh, and what is your policy regarding revisions if the artist expected something else? from your mastering? Um, they get the revisions. Okay. That's about it. Yeah. Um, sometimes uh, I advise, um, because sometimes the dilemma is people, um, specifically people who you know, work on their own, alone in their room, um, they tailor the music to their room, and then they get the master back, they verify it in the same room. And what sounded like spectacular in their room, suddenly there's no bass, or suddenly there's only bass, yeah, yeah. because it, it deals with the same signature again. So I advise them to go into a different room. And then very often the revisions are obsolete. Um, I advise people to carry around the music a little bit, listen to it on a, on a variety of, of sound systems, and, and live with it casually. Like after the mastering process, listen to it casually. Do not like get into that scrutiny kind of mindset. Get into a different listening mode. Talk to your friends while you listen to it. Things like this. Um, that I advise. Um, if sometimes the revisions, if I, if I have the feeling that the revisions 
to, in fact, um, incorporate a problem of the listening environment that they have, then I advise to double check. Yeah. Other than that, I, I do the revisions. Okay, but uh, the relationship, I mean, do you, when the artist sends you the mix, do you kind of get involved uh, as a mixing engineer and you share some insight, how do you perceive the mix and suggest some changes or improvements before the actual mastering session, meaning that... No. No. Only if uh, the sessions are attended. And if I feel like doing it, or if I feel like someone expects me to do it, then I do it. Uh, or if I'm, like, f very recently I've been working on a 30-year-old uh, recording of uh, traditional music from Papua New Guinea, or New Guinea. And uh, that is, like with recordings like this, it's sometimes difficult to justify if you are very invasive. Uh, but I was, because I felt like it's a huge work of, a huge body of work, and I felt uh, that the microphones are super present. And we are educated uh, to, like in these elderly, um, elderly recordings, we, we are educated to understand the recording signature itself as an, as an erratic momentum of the music. And I thought it was like very interesting to really take that out entirely. And I tried to erase all the modes of the recording and just like um, make the music live in a way it could if we would actually be standing there and listening to them. So that was insanely invasive. And then when I sent it back, I prepared a big speech to, um, to justify my invasive treatment. Uh, but they were just, and, and I started my speech and they were just like, no, we love it, it's fine, it's good. Okay. But, uh, but so usually there's not. Uh, I I do not actually seek uh, out the dialogue because I I feel like the treatment and the music should like speak in their own in their own right. That's really cool <laughs> because sometimes I personally get asked a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, can you please write us some feedback? Because a lot of artists are insecure because of their non-perfect home environment. They mm -hmm. they they kind of. Uh, hear everything perfectly in their own environment and then they get feedback from the from the another studio and they sometimes mm -hmm. are shocked or it's difficult to accept that their mix that it's their baby and sounds great sure. in their studio doesn't sound good elsewhere and yeah. vice versa it happened that i have an attended session and a guy came and we played his mix and he said hey man something's wrong with your speakers mm -hmm. and i was like what do you mean and he said this sounds great in my room something's yeah. wrong with your speakers yeah. and yeah. it was really difficult to be polite and to explain that yeah. uh, so that's one question that i always ask in attended uh, sessions uh, it's like is there anything that's surprising you when we li when we hear it here so are you like where's the bass or what where does all this bass come from or anything like that and then if people say yes then that's interesting to take into account. And if they say no, then that's the end of the conversation. Uh, but if people like ask me, do you have any advice regarding my production process, uh, then I, I try to give advice to my best knowledge. Okay, so one of the processes for removing notes is usually use of narrow peak filters. So do you use narrow peak filters in cut mode or in boost mode? Or, how, or do you use them at all? I mean, do you have this approach that you will try to clean up the mix of the modes that could be too strong for a particular type of sound? Yeah, I never boost anything. Uh, it happens once in five years that I boost something. Uh, and I would probably not boost narrowly. I don't think so. I cut very narrowly, as narrow as possible, actually. Okay. Uh, it's difficult to find the right filters um, to deal with that, um, but I found them, so. So what's your approach to high pass filtering, low pass filtering in the mastering stage, and what's the difference uh, in relation to digital master and vinyl master, or use of uh, the filters itself? Um, I tempt to not use high-pass high, high or low-pass filters. Um, but when cutting, uh, we have a, a Butterworth filter in our mastering desk that cuts at 8 hertz. Uh, because you can put like 0 0.5 hertz on vinyl, but it doesn't help much. Um, but we, so we cut it at, at 8 hertz uh, with, a, I think, 36 dB or something um, steepness. 
and very rarely I would use a low pass filter um, for the cutting to vinyl, but in mixing and in mastering that is not for a specific format, I did attempt to not use these. I believe it, in contrary to um, to common uh, agreement, I believe that 30 hertz are very crucial for the spatial, spatial imaging. Um, I, just from my experience, I feel like if I cut 30 hertz, something happens with the room. Um, so I, I try to leave everything in. That is not obviously an artifact. In computer music, sometimes you have crazy artifacts around 8 hertz or something like this, and then I do tend to take them out because they are not of any use. But besides that, no. So what do you mean that you never boost the EQ? So in a way you are working the passive type of principle, so that you do a lot of cutting and then you are just increasing the level of exactly. the actual track. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Boosting is kind of useless. I don't see... I mean, it's, I always, I always um, tend to advise people to flip their perception if they feel like this does not have enough high end. And that means it's too strong in the fundamental range. Yeah. And then just be like, the, I, f I think that the music lives in the fundamental range. And, uh, and, this, and often if you feel something is uh, not brilliant enough, then it's just too strong in the fundamental range. And if you like slim down the fundamental range, then the later harmonics will come up. And then you do a little, little bit of frequency selective compression, and then you lift up the whole signal. And that, in that way, you get a very transparent, very potentially loud kind of mix, but if you start boosting, you will have a very intransparent and very squashed kind of mix. Okay, because every boost you have to antagonize at a later stage. So, yeah, I've, yeah I always think negative in that, in that regard. Well, okay, so another thing is mid-side processing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what's your view on that? What are cons and pros of mid-side or regular stereo processing? And if you do mid-side processing, do you listen to the uh, solo in isolation and mid in isolation while, while you are EQing or processing? Uh, I work exclusively mid-side okay. in uh, mixing and in mastering. Um, and yes, I listen a lot uh, solo. Uh, also, when, in, when EQing uh, like uh, mono material, I, I switch mono, flip the face, uh, because it, it lets you like EQ at way lower levels with much more isolation. So I, I, like, I think I spend at least 50% of the time working on material listening to solo side, actually. Okay. And yeah, I, I'm very precious about uh, mid-side processing. I discovered it uh, like maybe 15 years ago and it opened a very different world for me in, in audio processing. Likewise. <laughs> so, uh, another thing, can you elaborate on your use of distortion, distortion and saturation in your mastering, mastering style? What kind of tools do you use for adding distortion and saturation? And do you use distortion in mid-side fashion? But I guess you do. I do. And uh, actually, exclusively on the side signal. Yeah. Uh, never made, it's like on the mid signal, it's, 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 it's crazy. Uh, on the side signal, it can be insanely beneficial, just to to give ex a few subtle extra harmonics, and then I, I isolate it very very strongly. And it, this this is all happening in parallel. It's yeah. al always something that is happening in the parallel processing chain, where I have a, a filter and a graphic EQ, and then uh, and then uh, two stages of distortion uh, with different tube settings, and then at the end of the day, what what comes into the master. It's only the range between like 12K and 20K maybe, and with a level of minus 40 dB or something like this. But that already is like is a, is a huge um, benefit to the liveliness of the of the music. Will you use some custom distortion generators, or these are like off the shelf regular processors? But kind of off the shelf, yeah. Slightly modified. Okay, so one of the mastering myths, out of phase bass, mm -hmm. uh, especially sub bass, uh, is it a problem? And what is your approach to deal with issues like that in a digital master situation and in a vinyl master situation? Digital master situation, 
I evaluate if it's intentional or, or not. If it's intentional, obviously, if it's a part of the, of the music, then I leave it in, of course. Um, for vinyl, there is certain restrictions. Um, I don't know how to how far into detail I should maybe I shouldn't at all, but uh, just um, there's uh, um, vinyl cutting itself is some kind of mid site um, information. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but it's you have a you have a difference channel and a, and a, a sum channel, but the difference channel is uh, modulated vertically. So there's just a physical limitation to how big these accelerations on a vertical scale can be before you cut down to the metal core of the lacquer or the stylus actually leaves the lacquer and clo closes the groove. Um, so you have to limit um, the very, very low end phase in, in very regularly. And I deal with it with either um, if, it's, if it's not so precious I deal with it with an elliptical EQ. Um, if it is very precious as a part of the music, I do it in mid-site uh, and use uh, frequency selective compression. Okay. So what do you use for frequency selective compression? Meaning, do you use any kind of multiband compressors or...? I don't like multiband compressors because they bring a lot of phase turbulence into the... I, I didn't find one so far that did not kind of disembody the music. Um, so I use uh, either I use a regular compressor and just uh, roll everything off, okay. uh, or I use a, a, a yeah a frequency selective compressor really, uh, not a multiband compressor. Okay. Good. Again, I, I'm sorry. I, I really don't want to say brand names. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's perfectly great. Why why would you? Um, can you share some mixing? or even production tips on how to prepare best mixes for mastering or vinyl cutting? Yeah, I just be very... very that's, a, that's a wide field. Yeah, very, very but wide I'd field. say just be happy as, you, as happy as you can with your music. I guess that's the best input for the mastering. I mean, if I hear something and it sounds very decisive and it sounds like... I absolutely here where it wants to live, then this is the best input for the mastering. That's maybe shit advice. <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry, but there's no, there's no, like, I can't say, like, keep a balance between bass and mid in a ratio, like, blah, blah, this is, there's no such thing. Okay, so one, another question. So can you describe compression and equalization in musical terms, not in technical terms? Meaning that, can you change the vibe or the groove of the track just by applying specific type of compression, specific type of equalization? And if you see this a goal in the mastering process, that you change the vibe and the groove? Um, and the pro it, well, it's a goal in case where I feel like this is the vibe where it's aiming at, but it's not fully living up to it. Uh, then I try to introduce it. Um, but not as a general paradigm within production. I wouldn't go generally like, what, what's the matter with this bass? It's not pumping. Yeah. Uh, but if it wants to be pumping and it is not, then of course I would try to make it pumping. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. This is as general as I can answer yeah, that. Yeah, but, I have but of course, obviously, like EQing and compression do change the narrative like strongly very often and then sometimes if I feel like it does sound more alive like this doesn't it then I turn around and ask that exact same question and then yeah even if I feel like it, it goes away from the original I'm not very um, I'm not very afraid to change the original in the mastering process Steve Albini hates me for that but I think it's fair enough um, there's so many steps from classical music production are just have just like are out of reach for for most musicians or for a big part of, of music culture. So it's fair enough to because always everything is allowed in, in recording and in mixing and but then in mastering suddenly it has to be like a an engineer who's like delicate. I don't feel that way. It's it's it, mastering can be just as invasive as mixing can if it helps the music. So okay. Um Hmm. <laughs> well, can you describe 
your sound? Is there a specific Rashad Becker sound that could be recognizable on the records that you worked on? People say there is. I'm not sure if I know what it is. I mean, I'm, as I said, I'm very um, cautious. I'm very, I pay a lot of attention to the fundamental range and to the early harmonic spectrum. Um, not so much like the, the later harmonics come at the very end of the, and they mo most of the time they sort themselves once you have the early harmonics and the fundamental range in, in place. Um, other than that, I don't know. There's of course, like I have my preferences, but I don't think they are necessarily, necessar necessarily a big part of the mastering process. Uh, because ultimately it's about the music that I encounter and where it wants to be and I don't feel entitled to say like, yeah, I want to have this signature sound on it. I'm, I'm sure there is a signature sound because that's the sound that I feel comfortable with, but I wouldn't know how to describe it. Yeah, it was, I wouldn't neither if somebody would ask me that. Mm. So actually, I get annoyed if people say, like, just give it your signature sound, because sometimes people do. And then I'm like, I don't really want to work with you. <laughs> okay, so it seems that anyone can be a mastering engineer nowadays, because all the tools are available and are really, really powerful on the computers. So what are the qualities and knowledge a mastering engineer must possess, in your opinion? So is there a secret knowledge or some black art involved in the... Yes, absolutely, but we can't talk about that, <laughs> obviously. It's secret knowledge. <laughs> Next question. Okay. No, um, absolutely not. Um, I think the, uh, the qualification uh, that you should have in working on someone else's music is feeling entitled with the decisions that you make. Uh, because it's, of course, a lot of responsibility that you take on uh, because you're the final, you do the final judgment before something that is very, very dear to someone uh, is is confronted with the rest of the world, and you're the intermediate, kind of, um, you're the intermediate. Um, so that that is a lot, a lot of responsibility, and so you should live up to that in the decisions that you make, and um, you sh should have a, a sense of relating to other people's work. Uh, I don't think at all that it has anything to do with knowledge of certain styles. Um, if, you, if people say, like, this is a great mastering studio for this kind of music, then I feel like this is not a great mastering studio. Um, is, mastering should not be someone who can relate to a certain style of music. Um, but generally feel entitled to make decisions on other people's works and, f and feel comfortable with them and be quick about them and have a, a sense of this kind of an experience of, of first encounter because that's very, very precious and that's exactly what's going to happen in the outside world. And um, so, yeah, train to have that, to have that moment, this like experience of the first encounter with someone else's work. Um, that's, yeah, that's the qualification you need. And on the technical side, it's super simple as all audio processing is. I mean, it's, it's, there's so little parameters. How much secrets can there be? Very few. You yeah. just have to practice, I guess. Okay, so you also do a lot of mixing and a lo do a lot of recording. Uh, and can you share some insight on your microphone techniques, creation of the right atmosphere and mode, mood in the recording uh, session? And where do you like to record your productions? Uh, in terms of space and vibe and so on. And uh, likewise, some insight you know, on your mixing style uh, when you record something or uh, uh, mixing style when you receive something that was recorded by somebody else in a different room. Like a lot of questions, but we can go step by step. Yeah. Um, yeah, I want to take this opportunity uh, to say something very, very general. Um, I don't uh, believe in any kind of style 
when it comes to recording or mixing. Um, there is, I, I know people are educated in certain institutions to uh, to specific specific or to mic techniques, miking techniques specific to instruments. I think that's total bullshit. Um, I think what you need to uh, the knowledge that you need in uh, all sorts of audio processing is to understand how you are listening, not even what you're listening to, but how you are listening. Be aware of how you are listening in a specific moment and, uh, and have an idea about what kind of narrative you want to put together before you start touching any equipment. And what I mean with that is, yesterday we were talking about uh, when you recorded that organ. Yeah. And when you sit in a church and you listen to organ music, or not in a church, if you listen in a, sit in a place with an organ and you listen to organ music, you never hear the mechanics because you don't listen to them. Of course you hear them, but you don't listen to them. As soon as you put a microphone on top of them and you go home and you record, listen to recorded signals, you hear the mechanics and you're like, ah, let me fetch my isotope. Um, <laughs> but, um, and the same happens, like also to me, quite regularly, I work with a singer, um, I put the microphone in front of her or his face, I record something or I listen to it through um, the speakers and I'm like, ah, oh, this is not the right microphone, this sounds very, there's very strong formants, this sounds very nasal. I go back into the vocal booth, the singer talks to me and I'm like, oh, it's the voice, actually. But I like might have spoken to that singer for days, and I've never listened to these kind of formants. Or it's like when you're having a conversation, you never hear, you never listen to the saliva that is like rupturing in someone's mouth. But as soon as you record it, you do listen to this. And um, so this is the most crucial knowledge that you can have, I guess, uh, to be aware of what kind of mode of listening you are applying uh, when you deal with recording. And other than that, um, as I said before, what kind of narrative uh, you are putting together? So what is what is the role of that cello going to be in that piece? What's the mood of that piece? Um, what What is the context of that piece? And which specific role is that cello going to have? So then that's the first idea you have in your head before you even look at the cello. Then someone takes the cello and you ask them to play it and you walk around in different proximities to the cello and you listen and you get an idea about what do you like about that instrument, what do you not like so much about that instrument, what, which of the parts that you like about that instrument will actually be a good part of the narrative that you're going to put together. And all of this you have to have an awareness before you even think about using a certain microphone. And once you know what you like about that instrument um, and the other thing, uh, then you can select the microphone. Uh, again, use your ears, use different proximities and decide with your ear which would be the good spot for the microphone and then put the microphone there and then <coughs> double check. Because of course the microphone is going to change everything. It has a very different perspective. But if you start with the microphone, there's no way you, want, you will have entitlement to, to judge what, what you're recording. I mean, everyone knows that, I guess, you scan an instrument with a microphone, you think like, oh, this sounds great, but what's going to happen if I move over here? Ah, does this sound better or not? I can't remember, let's go back. And then you, you get lost, and at some point, you're just gonna, it's just going to be somewhere, and you think like, let's fix that in the post-production. So to avoid this, um, know what you want to record uh, before you start recording. Know what you like about the instrument that you record before you start recording and then take it from there. Okay. A recording is always, is, it's, it's hyper real, it's never real. Um, be aware of that and know, yeah, know how you listen to, to, to things. Okay, and some mixing tips in general, what's your approach towards mixing? I mean, do you more of a do the stuff in pre-production stage, meaning that you're creating the mix while you are already setting the microphones, which you actually set already, and then in the mix stage, do you use a lot of processing or it's just fine balancing of levels and 
and doing automations or is it a lot of post processing? Um, it depends on the quality of the recording, obviously. Um, as I'd say, I always want to use, like, yeah, well, there's different levels of, of, of processing, of course. Some are like, if you apply a, 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 a room, um, that is a different thing than from EQing an instrument. I always want to do as little EQing as possible, obviously. Um, the first tip would be never boost. Also, in the mixing stage, never boost. Never look at a recorded signal the way like, what do I like about it? Uh, look at it in terms of what do I not like about it. Not like, what do I miss, but what is too much? And then get rid of what is too much or what you don't like about it. And then put it into perspective uh, to the whole mix. Go back and forth. Don't spend too much time with a solo instrument because it's potentially time wasted. Always uh, verify your processing of a single instrument in context of the mix. And also try to figure out what you do not like about the sound of the instrument in the entire mix. Because um, there's a lot of uh, psychoacoustic um, laws at work um, when the instruments play together. Uh, some of them you can benefit from strongly, uh, others will get in, into your way. Um, and you don't even have to know these things uh, as long as you always check in context. If you like to spend a day in sculpting a perfect guitar sound, that might be very it might be great, but it might completely fall apart as soon as the rest of the music comes back in. So you have to memorize, so you have to envision the perfect guitar sound and then sculpt it in context and not, not on a single instrument. And um, when it comes to processing, um, in terms of, for example, selecting a reverb and selecting effects and things like this, I always like to think uh, of musical um, processing in the, same, in the same terms as we would in other uh, forms of fiction. Um, so, uh, like if you select the reverb, for example, be aware of what kind of significance uh, this reverb uh, has um, has to, to, to listeners, or has in context of the narrative that's getting a very long sentence. <laughs> Maybe I should restart um, or address it in a different way. Um, I've, I've said this before, like, um, if you go into a very, very big room, um, some people are really humble by it, and they speak with tiny voices, and others just like start screaming and enjoy the reverb. Um, that is, like, this is something that is inherent in a big reverb. That is a, a part of, of, uh, of the fiction that you're putting together when you're mixing a piece of music. It will have an effect, of course, a big reverb has a different effect from a tiny slab back red room or something like this. So um, know what kind of fiction you want to produce when you select a reverb and be aware of uh, the many levels uh, that will come to play uh, when people receive um, that room. That might, some people might really feel very comfortable, might, others might feel very claustrophobic with, with small reverbs and that's that's a part of the of the music. It's uh, not a part of engineering. It's a part of the music, and you, I, I, I think I mean I think everybody has to find a personalized way. Um, but I think it's generally very helpful to think of music production as fiction, and um, and uh, try to put as much significance as possible into these elements like the wetness uh, and the and the and the, the slap echo and, and all these things they inform the listener and um, yeah that's helpful I think in decision making to think of it that way good okay so for the end uh, any thoughts on the future of mastering how it will evolve what's your opinion on artificial intelligence based algorithms like lander and stuff like that yeah uh, lander um, I think it's Great for tech house. <laughs> I, mean, I think it's. I mean, basically, I will, will come out and say I'm sick and tired of tech house, and I think it needs to stop. And I think it's Lander is a good fit for music that is basically algorithmic, and I think this whole culture could basically be dealt with with one Ethernet cable in the future, um, and. Um, 
Yeah. This is, I mean, it's good if you put together, for example, music for an uh, <coughs> ad spot. In the, in. the thing is, like, no algorithmic process can ever understand uh, the mood and the function, as I just said, that is a part of the music. And as you said in the beginning, imbalances might be very, very important. If I listen back to like the music that I have been enjoying when I was a teenager, it's full of flaws and it's full of imbalances because people had two days in the studio and so they just had to live with the decisions uh, that they made ad hoc. And this is what makes this mu music partially enigmatic and partially very tense for a very, very long time. And how will an algorithm ever receive that and see that this like total imbalance in the voice actually makes a piece a great piece? Um, I don't think that that uh, big data can can deal with that. But I think it's I mean this sounded harsh, but I think it's a really fair approach to functional music, uh, music that is highly paradigmatic like tech house, because tech house does have a way of sounding right, and uh, and big data is potentially better in dealing with that than a mastering engineer. But I think big data is also better in composing that music than a, a person would be. So I think Tech House should be entirely taken over by big data. <laughs> and, uh, and the rest of the music culture can just go on its, its business. <laughs> and the last question. Can you share an anecdote from the studio, like a worst nightmare scenario or most rewarding session in the studio. Uh, worst nightmare scenario. Uh, uh, Sixty minutes electroacoustic piece. One piece that was supposed to be treated in one hundred and thirty segments. Okay. That's a nightmare, and it's wrong, obviously. Uh, and it's not really an anecdote, <laughs> but it happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Sorry. And the most rewarding moment, for example, the the record that you really really enjoyed working or really. Ah, there's a lot. There's a lot, but there's one thing that kind of stands out. It's I don't know if I should say something like this, but. There's one production uh, that is, is also the mastering that was the longest ever uh, because it lasted for three days. And that was the second Super Collider record, uh, the uh, Raw Digits with uh, Jamie Liddell and, and Christian Vogel. And we just entirely remodeled and took it apart. And it was more fun, it wasn't like work. We smoked joints and drank whiskey and did stuff like this. It lasted for three days. And they actually listed me as a third band member after after that mastering, which I, I really, really appreciate because it was pretty early on also in, in, in my career. Um, and to the day, I think it's, a, it's a, a work I'm really proud of and it was just insane fun to, to do. And it's a fantastic record, in case people don't know it. Okay, thank you. I'm done with my questions. So now um, we'll give the mic to the public. So if anyone has any questions for a shop or me, you can just ask. <laughs> you should have a question. <laughs> Master Dub. Oh, sorry. No, no, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> These are near fields. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to ask you if you use um, near field monitors or you do you master on the main monitors or do you switch in between? What do you prefer, small monitors? Um, it's a, the, the ones that I use are pretty hybrid. They are they are mid field, um, and I use them in a position that is borderline near field, but like it is something like 90% midfield. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have uh, far field monitoring. Sometimes I would like to. Um, actually, in the vinyl studio, we have far field monitors that we use in midfield. In my studio, I have midfield uh, monitors that I use like 
in nearly in, in, in close to near field. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, I do have a question. Um, perhaps um, I didn't quite understand the part where you were talking about um, the mid range. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, what, what do you do? You remove the resonances? Do you remove the tones? Um, what is your uh, approach here? You mean the fundamental range? Yes, the funda yeah. fundamental range. I mean, range. this is like the, a, a huge part of musical instruments have their, their fundamental range in, this, in, a, in a very narrow part of the audio spectrum. Sorry, but fundamental range, this is not the low end? No. But what, what is fundamental range? Uh, fundamental so, range is if you take a sound apart, apart in, in, uh, in partials, and then the fundamental would be um, the, the, the note. For voice example, note. My, my voice, if I, uh, if I modulate my voice, uh, then if I speak with different pitches, that's the fundamental is what makes the pitch, and uh, the, the harmonics or the partials is what make the color. Um, so every sound consists of a, a harmonic row or partials, and the fundamental that actually represents the pitch. Um, some sounds do not have a fundamental. For example, uh, FM synthesis does not have fundamental, bells do not have a fundamental, but our brain still conceives a fundamental. That is something that we can take huge advantage of in, in, uh, in audio processing. Um, for example, if you are on a telephone, like most people have their fundament the fundamental range of the human voice is in between 120 and 350 hertz. The 350 hertz is really high-pitched uh, female or, or children voice. Um, so a uh, telephone uh, line only actually um, transmits 300 hertz to, to 3 ki kilohertz. So the fundamental range of a voice is not even transmitted through a telephone. Still, if we have someone on the telephone and they go like that, da, 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 we hear that, but it's only in our head. Uh, that's, uh, it's called a resi residual effect, and it's a psychoacoustic um, uh, attribute or property of the brain where from a significant harmonic row or from a significant set of partials, it synthesizes uh, the fundamental tone. Um, and that is something you can take a lot of advantage of in the mixing pro pro process because you have the voice and the guitar and the bass and whatever else lives in the music, all like, like uh, inhabiting the same very, very narrow band of the audi audible spectrum. And uh, they crowd each other, they uh, mask each other heavily you always a slightly higher frequency. If you have like a 320 and 323 hertz signals, the uh, 323 hertz will mask the 320 uh, sig signal, uh, 320 hertz content. That is also a psychoacoustical uh, trick of the brain. Um, so you can just lose the 320 because uh, it's going to be synthesized from the harmonics that. Um, that the 320 hertz uh, signal in the mix also carries. Sorry, that was not a good sentence. But was it understandable? Yes, sir. So that's that's why I, I why I said like the music lives in the fundamental range um, uh, because or it's that's a confusing way to phrase it. So of course, it lives in the harmonics because the harmonics is what makes the color. Like uh, it makes the um, you know like in 80s uh, ROM players, like the synthesizers that hit the market in the mid 80s, where you could play a piano and a shakuhachi and all these things. The fundamentals were not, they were sample players, that's why they're called ROM players, because they play recordings of instruments uh, from, from ROM, but the fundamental range is not a part of that. Uh, they, there's fundamental range, it's synthesized, it's basically a sign. And the only thing that is played back by the instruments are that is the harmonics. If you cut away the harmonics, I promise you, you will not be able to identify a note played on a piano or a flute. It's impossible to, 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 to understand which, which comes from which. So the fundamental range is not really where the music lives in terms of, um, of color, um, but it is where the problems 
uh, are emerging when mixing. Um, because the, if it, it gets crowded there, if it is intransparent there, then it's going to be intransparent in total. And you feel like you have to boost the high end and you have to boost the low end, and you don't really have to, you just have to clean up the final image. This is, this is what I try to say. Thank you very much for elaborating on that. <laughs> So, maybe now I have to explain fundamental range, we can talk more about harmonics, which are the thing. Yeah, well, as I said, like, uh, uh, there's actually there's three parameters that make uh, the color of the sound. Uh, it's the fundamental, it's the harmonic spectrum, and it's the formants. Uh, the formants are, is, the format is a frequency content in an instrument that is steady with, with whatever um, note you play, they don't change. For example, um, what makes my voice very uh, remarkable for everyone who knows me, uh, we always say like, oh, that's Richard's voice, uh, because I have a set of formants that is built by my neck, by my nose and my sinuses. These are resonant frequencies that will always resonate with Regardless if I go like, uh, or, or this, this part is always going to be in there. We don't hear it because we don't listen to it. If we start listening to it, we hear it and we go crazy. Um, but um, So this is what makes the sound identifiable. Um, the harmonic drone is what makes the sound, what gives the sound character. And that is like, for, um, yeah, that is how to explain that. Um, if you are, did you ever hear of fast Fourier transformation? And this is the harmonics. You have a, you have a, a, a like a, a layer, layers of signs that um, pa partially um, enhance each other, partially erase each other, and that makes the very significant signature of a sound. If you stroke a string, then you have a, like even even harmonics are uh, stronger than uneven ones. If you uh, blow into a trombone, you will have uneven ones strong. This is how you, yeah, that's yeah. the character of strings versus brass and so on. Yeah, so this I know what harmonics are, but I was interested if you search for a certain spectrum, that it is always present, because you said maybe there, you search for a certain balance, and yeah. you want some harmonics always present for a certain sound that you record. No, I wouldn't say so. I'm, I think I'm very sensitive to um, early harmonics of the bass range. And that is something that I want to also encourage people to pay attention to. Because it's very often in the mixing process that you just can't find the right level for an instrument. But that's just because you always pay attention to the fundamental. And then you, the fundamental seems right, but you feel like the guitar is too loud. You take it down too many pieces, it doesn't even live up to it anymore. And that's because you look at the wrong spot of the guitar sound. And, and with the bass, that's very often the problem. You can't find the right level because it suddenly it's too loud. If you take it down 1 dB, it doesn't seem loud enough anymore. But then shift your attention away from the fundamental. Look at the first harmonic, look at the second harmonic. Um, it's easy uh, if you train yourself um, for it. But, uh, but it's invisible or inaudible. Uh, to most people, as long as they don't pay attention. And then if you start, like, I do that a lot, actually, um, as I, when I say, like, uh, uh, here, like this, the first harmonic of the bass guitar is just way too strong, and it pushes away the voice, and they're like, oh, what are you talking about? And then, and then I sing it to them, and I go, like, ooh, this, and they're like, oh, wow, oh, yeah, oof, I didn't hear it. And it's sometimes, specifically with bass, like, with additive, uh, with subtractive synthesizers, and with real bass guitar, um, very often the, the first harmonics are actually stronger than the fundamental, but people do not hear them because they don't listen to them, because they listen only to the melodic progression. So, so when you adjust the levels, you can then have a totally different picture at the end? Yeah. Yes, absolutely, yeah. And, yeah and, and the early harmonics in the bass range very often conflict with the fundamentals of, of everything else. So it's, it's beneficial to, to be at least very decisive about it. I mean, very often people want that bass sound with the strong harmonics, but very often also people just have it without even realizing that they have it. They just see that they have a problem with integrating. And then there's one EQ and suddenly there's no more problems. 
I also have one question. Uh, I don't need my question. Uh, like you addressed how you uh, changed the recording from 30 years ago from uh, New Guinea. Yeah. And just like um, a question of a medium, if I understand right. So like with, I would address it uh, this one maybe with uh, like uh, field recordings and such. Uh, how do you go for um, mastering such materials? Do you like like to amplify maybe the um, medium itself or do you rather go for uh, like bad fiction? It really depends. I'm, I, I, I feel personally, this is, field recordings is a difficult, um, it's a difficult thing for me because I always feel like with, with our, um, with the little awareness that we have about how easily we are tricked in terms of um, auditive reality, um, I'm always a bit like um, opposed to the idea of field recordings because um, to, to make it short, like if you, the whole like postmodern discourse on, on the, the reality of a picture, uh, which, which is now um, like just deep consensus within all our societies, totally independent of uh, of grade of education or something. Everyone who looks at the picture takes into account that it might be tampered with. There's no reality to pictures uh, since since a very long time. So if you show someone the picture and say like, hey, that's Rome. They say like yeah. fuck off. That's your decision. That's just like that's a that's your author authorship. But if you play someone a field recording and say like this is the Amazonas, people go like ooh, and, um, and that's that, that is a bit sad. That uh, the the the, um, the scrutiny of causality principles in auditive media is years behind um, other media, and I think it's representative of how we constitute a reality around us because we don't use our ears much. To, to scrutinize uh, causality. And it's really unfortunate because it's a, it's a great sense. Uh, it's time-based, it's 360 degrees. It can uh, cater for a lot more uh, uh, simultaneous ideas of causality than our eyes actually can. But we do use our ears like bad eyes. And, uh, and um, so when I hear field recordings, I personally always want them to sound time -aware. I don't want them to sound like naturalistic, but of course that is not my choice to make. Uh, but uh, the artist, uh, the field recording artist's choice. So if I, I ask basically. But if I do, um, I'm, today's technology is not as self-revealing as it was 30 years ago. But if I listen to recordings that were made 30 years ago, and it's like it's a group of drummers, and then it's a group of singers, and then it's a group of flutes, and I always hear the same forms in that case. I know this is not something that they all incorporated, but that is the actual microphone, uh, because they have their formants too. And so if I feel like in this recording, uh, the microphone is super present, and that could be, as I said before, like a, a, a valuable oratic element of that recording, but it could also be just a pity. So that's the call that I have to make then. Mm -hmm. If I erase um, the, the parts that make the recording an actual recording, uh, or if I leave them in because they, they, it caters for the atmosphere or for, you know, for the narrative. Uh, that's some, something that in, yes, some regularly needs some dialogue with, with the artists. Mm -hmm. I also have one question. Uh, can, in your opinion, uh, proper audio processing, whether in mixing stages or in master, or, uh, at mastering stages, be done only with digital tools? Sure. Well, I don't think there's anything that is like pro analog or pro digital. Um, both uh, realms have very specific attributes uh, and cater for very specific tasks. Some tasks might be better uh, with the one realm and some with the other realm, but none of the realms are like generally superior. For example, I'm super not a friend of tape. I don't care much for tape. Uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a fetish and uh, it doesn't always, it do, doesn't help music like generally or obviously always. Uh, but in some cases tape can just do the absolute perfect and right thing to the music. Um, my objection is working with plugins, but that's me uh, because I'm informed in a way that I don't want to be informed by the numeric. Importing digital equipment generally tends to um, reveal numeric 
um, attributes stronger than analog equipment. But I do use uh, digital equipment, also digital filters, and um, they are great in some regards and not so great in other regards. As I have no preference, or I'm not, I'm not an apology of one of the other. I also have another question. How do you set the headroom that you use you, you set when you're mastering that you don't use uh, limiters mm -hmm. anymore? So I don't know, how, how do you actually decide what is going to be I don't know, the maximum possible level, so, so to say? And, and if you, you also mentioned that the old, old school music, I guess, of the mm -hmm. 70s or the 80s had some certain peaks that were way beyond. Uh, uh, the level of anything else on, mm -hmm. on that concrete recording. So, is that even possible? I don't know to do um, in, in, in in the context of how you do the mixing or mixing for that matter. Um, well, uh, I'm very cautious, and everybody should be very cautious about transients. Um, that is one of the reasons that I do not use limiters anymore, but also just because I'm way more happy with my trans rig, but my, oh, how do you say that in English? Uh, with the transformer that I have in my mixing desk and the saturation I can achieve with that, I'm just ha happier with that than with the limiters that I have in my hand. Um, but I, like, limiters are better now. Um, than they used to be 20 years ago. Um, and specifically, digital limiters can do things that analog limiters could not do or can never do, and that is uh, a look ahead. Um, and uh, that is something very beneficial, and only, I think, to limiting. I don't see the benefit of it in compressing, but in limiting I absolutely do, because you can preserve the transient and still catch massive peaks. You couldn't do that 20 years ago, so I think like a pop production where there is in the middle of the piece uh, like a big spike that you don't really hear uh, or that doesn't really do something for the story, um, this doesn't have to be there nowadays anymore. Um, so I would basically, I think I would have turn that down specifically for vinyl um, because it would set the headroom for the whole production in a certain way. Um, other than that, because most music nowadays gets uh, encoded um, into to MP3 and AAC and all these codes, uh, and you do get uh, distortion and intersample artifacts. Um, I did tests at my place with reporting and analyzing the intersample peaks, and now I, I finally ended up always giving 0.6 dB headroom. Um, so the final headroom of the of the digital master is always going to be at least 0.6 dB FS. Um, it can be a little bit more. Uh, it shouldn't be less because then you run into if you go like for zero dB headroom, you will have like massive distortion in the encoding. Not distortion that sounds like, that, but the in linearizations will change the sound when you encode stronger than it already does. To be safe, just give it a, a, a dB of headroom. It doesn't make a difference. So it's a weird, it's a weird race. Yeah, I have a question here um, regarding. Uh, do you think? Uh, um, what about the mastering your own tracks? Do you think that it's a good idea, or you, regardless of knowledge, or you should always send it out to the mastering engineer? Yeah, I think. I mean, one idea of the mastering is uh, to bring a perspective um, that is informed by the big picture uh, rather than by the detail. And as I said, uh, to have this precious moment of the, of the first hearing of the whole thing. Um, you as a composer, uh, you will never have that. It's impossible to produce. And you will never have the distance and you will never hear the piece for the first time. Um, so I think uh, there's something something big to be gained uh, to give it to someone you trust uh, to make those final decisions and potentially also like just get rid of things that you have been like deeply in love with uh, throughout the whole process of the music making because no one will ever uh, hear them 
um, like as I said, for example, this like early harmonics on the bass, people don't pay attention to them, um, and the whole piece piece will suddenly breathe if you take them back a little bit. But you yourself, you will not be entitled to make that decision because you can't let go. Um, so I did master my own uh, music, and I faced exactly that problem. Uh, but I was too curious actually to see what it's going to be like on violin. Uh, and I didn't want to stress out my colleagues by throwing it in their faces. So I did it myself. Uh, but I would generally say if you have the means, um, that means if you have the money and if you have someone that you trust uh, or someone that you can find a dialogue with uh, that you feel safe, I think it is a good choice to give it to someone else. If you do not have the money, uh, or you have no one around you, uh, then you can of course give it a try. I mean, because I've been criticized before to just say like, you shouldn't do it. And people said like, what the fuck, so you hate DIY culture. That's absolutely not what I try to say there. Um, it's just that it goes against the idea of mastery to do it. How do you go about tuning the fundamentals? EQs. Filters, EQs. Yes. Yeah. Mastery, like when you have everything together, yeah. but few instruments, also the same. Also the same, yeah. Um, as I said, I, 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 deal, I, I use uh, inside processing. Um, <coughs> that already gives you a whole... It, it's difficult to describe once you, if you don't experience it how much access it actually gives you to a stereo signal. It's, 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 you can still like carve around it like crazy. Um, yeah, that's not a very technical term. Um, but it's basically, it's filters. It, it always, it's always filters. I mean, there's no other tools to address uh, frequency, com frequency attributes of sound. And it's about sight, you also are looking for fundamentals and picks, or what do you do inside the key? Um, yeah, basically, it, it really depends. Sometimes, if, uh, if there's, like, for example, layers of layers of reverb, you just get a lot of redundancy. Um, that you, like, I look for either elements that are redundant, elements that are underrepresented or that get kind of masked up, and I try to free them up. Um, it, it really depends. I can't, there's no. It depends on the condition of the material and what the material means. But I treat the side signal pretty much the same way I treat the mid signal. You have to be careful if you work with uh, real instruments and a real, real stereo, because what we call stereo most of the time is not stereo. Stereo is only things that have been recorded with microphones that are set up as a stereo pair of microphones. That's stereo. Everything else is just, just two channel. Um, if you work with real stereo uh, and you're doing the side processing, you have to be really careful because uh, if you if you change uh, the level in the side signal half a dB, uh, the cross bleeding from the left channel to the right channel is already 20 dB more. Um, so you have to be careful, specifically with, with dynamic processing, also on the side signal because it might you might end up having a guitar that jumps into the center, or any, anything that is on the side and the, and the uh, compressor uh, responds to it differently from the mid, and the musical instruments will just jump around on stage. Um, that can be fun too, but it's made, most of the time it's not. It's actually something that I use in, in production, um, but in mastering you, should, you would need to be careful to not, do, not have them do that. Um, yeah, but, but this taking into account, I treat the side signal the same way I would uh, treat the mid signal. <coughs> Questions? <laughs> Uh, just one more question. You mentioned earlier that you don't use multi-band compression mm -hmm. limiting, but uh, do you use buses uh, 
groups, groups do you send uh, I don't know kick drum ba bass line I mean the lower frequency the instruments that are more on lower frequencies on one bus and then you compress that bus and you, you make one group for let's say uh, in mixing yes in mixing yes absolutely not necessarily uh, uh, regarding frequency range but more like role in the in the composition or role in the mix it's not necessarily like the, all the low spectrum or the high spectrum but it's more like the lead instruments the percussive instruments things like that but i use us as excessively Uh, you talked about reverb, uh, reverbs. Mm -hmm. uh, do you record reverbs at your room with mics and and add it digitally then on hardware units or uh, plugins or how um, you I, I do use some. Uh, I, I I have a very nice sounding um, staircase. I use that. Sometimes I uh, I did things like, for example, have the singer sing out the window, and uh, because I have a, a, a fire a protection wall about five meters across from my studio, and I had him sing out the window, window and re recorded the reflections of that wall uh, from the other window, uh, I used transducers uh, to send the sound through my radiator and then pick it up on the other side with contact mics. And I have a filing cabinet uh, that has um, transducers in it and, uh, and uh, also contact mics. And I, I can I open the drawers uh, to change the, the structure born feedback within that filing cabinet. So I use all kinds of things that are fun. Um, and also I use uh, Kima for digital reverbs. That is a programming language that is basically it's a black box DSP uh, on which you can write um, audio algorithms and that is the best tool that I have encountered so far for making digital reverbs. Uh, and I have a few old school first generation uh, digital reverbs uh, like from mid 80s that just sound insanely colorful that don't sound like a, a reverb or a room or anything like that at all they sound like a like an artificial um yeah, like an effect way more than a room so and tell you well, when you're recording uh, you play something to a speaker and then record it uh, real reverb or when when you're recording someone uh, you you record you up with it. Yes, I, I did that sometimes. For example, with my with my staircase, just a, one speaker like two floors down, and and, and put a stereo mic in, in on my floor, and, and things like that. But that's not the the rule or like the general whatever <coughs> whatever fits. Okay. Okay, last question. Thank you for today. Mm -hmm.